Hey, Penrith Baptist Church, welcome to this week's online message. Last week, we started a new series called Signs, where we talked about John's purpose for writing the book of John and uh, just how he put it together. It's, it's really quite masterful. But he said this in John chapter 20 as to the reason why he wrote the book and partic particularly about the signs that he refers to. So he says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus writes this, this book of John, the Gospel of John, that we, that we glean so much from for that purpose, that we may believe that Jesus wasn't just a good man, that Jesus wasn't just a, a good teacher, uh, that he wasn't just a prophet. But John's saying, I'm writing this book, writing about these signs, so that you may believe that Jesus is actually the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. So we talked about that a lot last week. And so we're going to actually start looking at what the first sign was that John wrote about. We'll get to that in just a moment. But almost like bookends to the, these seven signs, there's a couple of references that John records of what Jesus said. For example, in John chapter 2, uh, he says in verse 4, talking to Mary, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now, Mary's just about to start um, talking to Jesus about fixing an issue at a wedding where they've run out of wine. And so Jesus responds and says, kindly, woman, my, my hour has not yet come. And then we actually go through, John records the seven signs, the seventh sign being where uh, Lazarus is raised from the dead. Spoiler alert on that one. But then he says, after the seven signs that he records, he says in uh, John chapter 12, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So Jesus is saying back in John chapter 2, the hour, my hour has not yet come. And then in John chapter 12, the hour has come. That's really important and really significant because what we see is more of what John is trying to communicate to us that all of this links together, all of this ties together, all of this points to Jesus being revealed as the Christ so that when he goes to the cross, we know what's going on. So that when Jesus goes to the cross, we know why he's doing it. We know that he's going because he is the saviour of the world. We, we know that he is the hope of the world. We know that he is the redeemer of all humanity. And these seven signs are a setup and a, a, an informational to reveal that Jesus, like I said before, isn't just a good guy, but he is the Christ. He is who he said he was, or he was, he said who, who he is, if I get that in the right order. All right, so let's get into John chapter two, and let's look at this first uh, miracle that Jesus performs here. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee and Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jars, water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. 
What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. On the surface, this miracle probably doesn't surprise us too much, given that we're talking about Jesus. Uh, John chapter 1, uh, John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little bit further down in John chapter 1, John writes that, and the Word became flesh, referring to Jesus, and dwelt among us. So Jesus is, is the Word. Jesus is the personification of the Word of God. And we know that God's a creator. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, it starts off also with those words, in the beginning. You know, and God created this and God created that and he spoke and this came into being. We're just using his voice, using his word. Everywhere you look around you in creation, God created with his, with his words. So it, it probably doesn't surprise us too much then because we're talking about Jesus, that, that he could, that he could do this. He can and speak and what didn't exist before now does exist. But John is, is not necessarily writing about turning water into wine just to show that Jesus can do something cool and something miraculous. It, it goes much deeper than that. John is actually making some massive statements in those verses that I just read about Jesus and who he is. And so I've got three statements that I want to bring out today. And the first statement is this, that Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Moses. And this was important, particularly for the Jewish people, because they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a king. They were looking for someone like a Moses that would bring them out of their metaphorical Egypt to their oppression of the Romans. They were looking for a, a David kind of king that would come and, and deliver them and, and fight back. Again, that, that's who they were looking for. But, but John is saying Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus in, can do more than Moses. Just like Moses delivered Israel out of slavery. Jesus is greater than that. And so I want to look a little bit about what happened here in, um, in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 7. Listen to these words. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and the canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. Right now, let's go back to John chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jewish people, by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water and so they filled them to the brim and then as we read before that water becomes wine Jesus is showing that he is greater than Moses by showing and that he's able to replicate the changing of water but but by his own word if you remember back in Exodus chapter 7 where we read God said and Moses did this time, Jesus said, and it happened. So Jesus is greater than Moses. And this was really important. This was a, a revealing of who Jesus truly is. There's a second statement here, that Jesus' blood is better than ceremonial water. In Leviticus, there's a couple of places there where um, the unclean men and unclean women would need to be washed by water, this kind of water in these kind of stone jars that were used for ceremonial washing. And, and I won't go into the details of it. Leviticus is, is pretty uh, gruesome and gory in some places. But let's just say that, that for men and women who had different things going on within their body, um, they were considered to be unclean. 
And so this water would actually be there used for ceremonial cleansing that, that once the, the issues and, and things and whatever was going on had finished, they would use this water to then become ceremonially clean. That's what would happen. They would take a person, there would be a person, if you're unclean, you could use this water and you were clean. Now, back in this time in Cana and Galilee, it, it had kind of progressed a little bit beyond Leviticus and they would just use the water to, to kind of show that they're clean anyway. Um, so it, it kind of became a little bit more of traditional stuff, but there was an original purpose way back in Leviticus too, where it was actually something that they needed to do to be to be clean. So if you were unclean back in the day, um, you would actually have to be separated. You were not allowed to come in contact with anybody else. You had to remain, I think, 50 yards away uh, if you were unclean. And if someone was getting close, you would have to call out unclean so people would know that they needed to stay away. And so this water represented that declaration that what once used to be unclean can now be clean. And of course, it was only temporary because someone then would actually become at some point unclean again and then they'd have to go through a process and, and use the water again and then be declared clean all over again. And sometimes the priests had to get involved as well and they would make a declaration that they were, no, they were, they were now clean. It was a, a big and a massive thing. So it's no coincidence that or fluke that Jesus happened to use those specific water jars, the ones that were used for ceremonial cleansing. It's no coincidence that Jesus said, I want you to use those jars. Those ones that you used for that temporary cleansing, I want you to take that and now completely changed it to what we know in, in, as, as wine, as a representation of the blood of Christ. What would actually flow as forgiveness for our sin. His blood that washes over us and transforming us to be the righteousness of God through Christ. It's no mistake, is it, that Jesus said, take those jars that you use for ceremonial cleansing to be going from unclean to clean. And I'm going to fill it with something that is a representation of my blood that cleans you forever, that cleans you once and for all. It's a beautiful picture. And this is, this is the statement that Jesus is making, that Jesus' blood is better than the ceremonial water. Jesus' blood is perfect. The ceremonial water was not perfect. It was temporary. It wasn't for long at all. Now, there's an example in, in the book of Mark where we actually see this kind of lived out and carried out in a really powerful way. And so I want to read this from Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, uh, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. And yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out for him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around against you, his disciples answered, and, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, daughter, your faith 
has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, before I mentioned that if you were unclean, that you had to be a certain distance away from everyone else, this woman should not have been by law, should not have been in that crowd. She should have been somewhere off to the side and whenever anyone would get close, she would have supposed to have yelled unclean, stay away because of her issue with blood and her bleeding. She was unclean by that definition. And so I'm not sure what she was doing there in and amongst the crowd. I don't know. Maybe people didn't know what was going on. And so maybe she was just trying to be in stealth mode. Um, but clearly she, she was not supposed to have been there in, in that culture and that tradition. And yet she being unclean came up behind Jesus with this faith to say, if I, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now this story here is about healing, but it's also about this uncleanness that she had. And this is a, a really powerful story because here's the beautiful thing. If you are unclean and you came in contact with someone who was clean, if you shook their hand, if you touched them on the shoulder, if you got too close to them and bumped into them, the unclean person would make the clean person now unclean. Now you've got two unclean people. It's not too dissimilar to, um, I guess, COVID and, and how we saw COVID spreading so quick. If you were around someone with COVID, um, we all believed that if we got too close with someone with COVID, we'd get COVID and those who are in contact with us, they would get COVID too. And certainly we saw COVID spread all around the world, didn't we? The, the unclean, if I want to use that terminology for this metaphor, um, would make the, the clean people, the, the non-infected people now infected. Now they would be unclean as well. And so this is kind of the context here that an unclean person like this woman would ceremonially make another clean person now unclean because they've come in contact with someone who is unclean. So what's going on here? This is, this is the beautiful thing. Jesus is clean. The unclean woman touches the clean Jesus, but Jesus doesn't become unclean. The opposite happens. The clean one, Jesus, makes the unclean clean. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus, if he was anyone else, if he wasn't Jesus, Anyone else that woman touched was now unclean. But the opposite happened when, when she touched Jesus, the unclean woman touched Jesus. This is the beautiful thing. This is grace. This is, this is God's love. This is, this is the, the righteousness of Jesus, the perfection of God through Christ. This is now the unclean being made clean by, by Jesus. And this ties back too to what we're talking about with the water jars and Jesus filling, filling those water jars with, with water that becomes wine. And, and now the, 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 the old way is now replaced with the new and perfect way. The blood of Jesus was a once and for all sacrifice. It doesn't have to get repeated. It doesn't have to get done again. It's once and for all. It's the beautiful thing, isn't it? That the unclean is now made clean. We who are unclean in our sinful condition, we who are unclean in our unrighteousness, in contact with Jesus, we are now made clean through Jesus. We are now, the Bible says, made the righteousness of God through Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us on our behalf so that we now could be clean, that we could now be the righteousness of God, that we could be the cleanness of, 
of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful, that miracle? That's the miracle. It's not about the water and the wine. The real miracle is that we have been made the righteousness of God through Christ. Just about to finish here. In John chapter 2, we, we said, Jesus, we read these words. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. So my third statement that I want to make today is that all of who we are filled to the brim, all of who we are becomes all of who he is. He is our peace. He is our joy. He is the very source of our love. He is our rest. He is our hope. He is our redeemer. He is our savior. And as John writes, and this is his point, this is what he's driving home. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. This sign is not about Jesus turning water into wine, although it was, but it's deeper than that. This, is, this sign is all about life transformation through Jesus. Not partially, not temporarily. You are not a renovation. You are a new creation, miraculously transformed fully and forever. That is who you are. That is who we are. So this message today, it's, it's not really about, okay, so what do we do next? Tell me, what, what's their application? How do I apply this to our life? Well, it's not necessarily about a list of do's and don'ts and things that we should do and, and things like that. This, this is about knowing who we are, believing who we are in Christ and living from that place, being filled to the brim with Jesus. He has washed you clean, completely, fully, without exception. The clean has made you clean. And so the last verse in this water into wine passage, verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Why is John writing about water into wine? To reveal the glory, to reveal Jesus' glory, to reveal who he is that we would point he's greater than Moses. He, he's better than Moses. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. He is the Prince of Peace. And that Jesus is revealing his glory through each of these signs and starting with this first one, water into wine. And his disciples believed in him. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in who he is? Do you believe what he's come to do? And do you live in that? Does he live in you fully? That's what we want to do. That's what our Mondays look like. That's what our tomorrows look like. That's what today is, what tomorrow looks like, that we live with this revelation, that we are the righteousness of God through Christ. The clean has made the unclean clean once and for all. That's amazing what a blessing. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the depth that's in your word. I thank you for what we learned. Lord, I pray today that there would be an inspiration that we receive, uh, a revelation of who Jesus is, a deeper revelation. And Lord, that it would resonate in us and that we would live from an, a different place of an identity, that we wouldn't walk around with a sense of where we're just unclean and waiting for our next dose of Jesus. No, we have been made clean by Jesus. That is who we are. And Lord, I pray that we would live from that place, that we would continue to bring glory to his name and grow more and more in our belief and knowledge of who Jesus is. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.